So welcome back. Um, I don't believe we have any public commenters signed up. Uh, okay, good. So uh, hearing none, then we'll end the public uh, comment section and we'll move directly to our committee discussion. So now the committee members are going to discuss what we've learned yesterday and today from our guest presenters, panel discussions, and background materials. PTAC will submit a report to the Secretary of HHS with our comments and recommendations based on this public meeting. Members, you have a document of potential topics for deliberation tucked into your binder to help you guide the conversations. If you have a comment or question, please flip your name tent up or raise your hand in WebEx. Who would like to start with their comments? Lauren, thank you. I'll get us started with a few trends from the early presenters. So um, what actually is enhancing um, care transitions actually in delivery? People mentioned some really interesting best practices, including bundles, pathways, transition guides, flags, and standard of care practices in reaching to other systems. So really utilizing tools, workflows, and best practices to build anticipatory care management and disease management. So proactively addressing the needs um, on a medical level for clients, but also using that same framework for addressing social determinant of health needs. That um, there's a real trend of issues with health-related social needs driving complexity in care transitions and a need for um, integration of payment or thought about that with how do we finance that delivery system in the community itself. The concept of hubs was mentioned um, multiple times, either these care transition teams functioning as a virtual hub to link people together or actual emergence of um, hubs in the community organizing and connecting providers across sectors. Um, and then uh, the in importance with workforce that we really need to look at diversity of roles, potential payment for teams or non-physicians when we look at care, tra care transitions, and the integration of digital um, options, for example, a digital care coach that can escalate to a person to extend the reach of these teams. So a lot of very foundational and interesting concepts for us to consider. Thank you, Lauren. <clears throat> a few uh, high-level topics that I kept hearing over and over was um, operational scalability, uh, the fact that 75% of physicians are employed today as opposed to the 25% independent. I kept hearing team-based care and the need for teams, the need for team-based uh, payment models. Um, and integration across the uh, system of care uh, with uh, systems thinking uh, and bringing up the question of uh, who is the accountable entity and how does the primary care provider or specialist uh, fit into that new schematic of what a, a system of care looks like. We also heard some great comments from uh, Mary Naylor who uh, outlined her model of uh, transition of care. I uh, thought that was very comprehensive and a well-tested model. She gave very specific metrics for measuring potential outcomes. Um, it's a model that um, I think we sh should consider this model as a package uh, for an, uh, integration into other models to, to be embedded into APMs or to be paid specifically, as she described, as a 60-day bundle payment either separately or embedded with a, within another APM or ACO model. Um, we also uh, continue to hear over and over uh, about the need for data, particularly in the ambulatory setting, and the integration across uh, various ambulatory uh, units, including SNFs and nursing homes, but also other um, community organizations, other uh, for-profit organizations, how, how do we uh, invest in developing some type of meaningful use model to uh, integrate those uh, various entities together to be able to share, share data better? Um, so I'll stop there. Larry? Well, 
my comments from the two from the two day meeting. My first one is that we need a transition to accountable care. And I think this really came out in the course of the meeting is that we can't just move without going through a transition period. And we need to focus on that and focus on how we build hybrid solutions that take us gradually out of fee for service into value based into accountable care. Um, and the example, the best example were, were the TCM codes. Uh, can we expand them to the use of multiple providers following a hospital admission? And then can we track that data over time to help build the payment model that will ultimately be the value based model? I think using that as an example of what we have to do across the board in these transitions but you know that that was my first takeaway second one and i said this yesterday we have to stop using the word discharge and uh, focus on uh you know not discharge summaries but the transition summary the transitional care summary um and then again on the same flavor of uh um transition is the transition to digital care and how we we can't let the chaos drive the solutions. Uh, we need to have an organized approach as to how digital therapies, as they get developed, become integrated into care. Uh, I like the concept in the letter that we're, you know, that we're going to send. That payment drives that. You know, where the payment goes will drive. You know, who controls where that digital technology uh, is deployed. And um, and then down the same theme, integrating nested solutions into uh, population-based total cost of care models. But what I have to emphasize is that we can't just have these for inpatient care. Uh, to have an inpatient bundle with an, as a nested solution just defies the reality that we live in. That what happens in the outpatient setting can avoid that hospital admission or can alter that hospital admission. Um, you know, it can become a medical admission instead of a surgical admission. So we have to, when we build our nested models, our nested models have to bring in multiple specialists, but they also have to bring in the longitudinal care, not just focusing on the inpatient. And the final one I'm going to pile on to what was said already is the data piece. You know, um, I forget which one of our SMEs mentioned it, but said $30 billion created a situation where now just about all of the hospitals in the country and, and medical practices in the country are digitalized. Maybe we need a second one to make sure we're all on the same database because the mistake we made in meaningful use was deploying this and now we have all these silos of data all over the place and we have, uh, we have tools now that may be able to bring those databases together, but it would have been nice to have that homogenized from the beginning. Um, and uh, those are my points. Thank you, Larry. Uh, Jim? Or Chini, were you up first? Okay. There are a couple things that stood out to me um, as we listened throughout the two days. The first one was that there's clearly a variation of application of, of transitional care, whether it's code based or whether it's episode based. And, you know, we heard one from Mary that was highly effective. We heard Signify speak to it. We heard Sound speak to it. And so I think that the take home to me is that that variation is going to exist and need to exist for scale. Um, Josh and I were talking about this earlier, but getting to consistency and what I would focus us on is, you know, how do you measure outcome and, and what are the outcomes we hold people accountable for, but still allow for the variations that, that all of our panelists demonstrated could work. The second thing is um, the period of time that I think that's another place where we might be able to find a common denominator is when does the time start? in what we would call transitions of care 
and when does it end and, and what do we call that episode of time? And I think defining whether it's 60 days at a start of a hospitalization, whether it's too home, too post-acute, and, and what those different parameters are is a place where our committee could maybe provide um, through this work some definition. The third thing that I found um, really elucidating was the fact that there is a difference in thought on what is a payment model versus a clinical model versus an operating model. And I think us having complete clarity on what we're asking for and how one thing leads to another, the clinical models typically sit outside, but a payment model clearly leads to an operating model. And so just having some clarity on what, is, what it is that we are asking organizations to do and how are we crafting that ask, I think is important. What is a lever? And the last thing that I would have liked to have gotten a little bit more clarity on, and I think we need to do some thinking around, is the connection to the PCP and that longitudinal care of all of these platforms. There's obviously this foundational data element and how people can real time talk to each other and, and what transparency the PCP knows and how they can leverage that data. But there's also the relational component. So as a third party or such as Signify and, and Sound often is integrated or some of these other uh, point of care type of integrations, how do you get the buy-in of the primary care group and how do you get the buy-in of the hospital system to, to invite you in to sort of allow for this sort of intervention to happen with various stakeholders. And I think that is still pretty nebulous. And without that buy-in, you can't plug into the continuity of care that really needs to happen. Thank you, great comments. Jim? I think these last two days of really been excellent and I think uh, the panels uh, and the expertise uh, that came together uh, was really special. So thank you uh, to Walter and uh, and the team that did that. Um, I won't repeat uh, previous comments um, and uh, won't repeat my comments from yesterday, but I think from just today uh, there were three principles, I will call them, and then four um, practical uh, messages uh, that I heard. Uh, the first is we've currently gotten from a principal perspective, we have an uneven uh, playing field and, and Rick talked about this uh, between Medicare Advantage, uh, the ACO programs and really the, the third wheel um, or the, the third rail uh, is fee for service um, you know, plus minus incentives like uh, MIPS. And uh, we heard the recommendation today uh, that there should be a strategy to bring these three paths together, um, because if not, the market will move to the path of least resistance. Uh, and that's what we're, what we're seeing. We had a lot of experts talk to us about what that path of least resistance might look like um, and why it might not be the right path. Second, I heard that uh, currently our model incentives are too weak. Uh, in that there's got to be a short line um, between the incentive uh, and then ultimately the uh, behavior uh, that is desired or what that desired outcome is. And I think we spent a lot of time in our last session talking about integration of specialist cares, uh, trying talking about the disconnect between uh, where the payment goes uh, and then those who are actually delivering the work and how those feel disconnected so it's not a true incentive. Uh, and then also a corollary to that is that uh, that just the current focus on uh, disproportionate focus, excuse me, on PCPs is not sufficient to move the lever on quality uh, or cost. Then from a practical perspective, um, I heard this is uh, amplifying uh, what was previously said, but I, I think uh, it's important enough to say that in the post-acute space, uh, a structured payment uh, in the to incent infrastructure um, around implementation or integration or IE interoperability uh, is critical. Uh, even if it's just a focus in the post-acute space, but then we also heard conversation about how well, we will be um, unsuccessful leveraging community-based assets if we also don't extend that integration. Uh, and that requires uh, an, a, a deliberate infrastructure, i.e. utility cost. 
Uh, next, that we heard today and we've heard in previous sessions, mandatory is necessary. Uh, and uh, although uh, the path to get there is just as important as the end point, uh, we heard from our experts that the DRG system took 15 years to, mater to mature. Um, so uh, we are, there is an opportunity um, to now uh, better define where the goalposts are from that perspective. Uh, we also heard uh, that fee-for-service uh, payments uh, in the TCM space are inadequate to cover uh, a care team. Uh, and and all, we heard about wonderful care models, but how the payment model does not incent uh, what we know uh, is a care model uh, that actually delivers outcomes that we care about. And then we also heard from one of our speakers uh, that bundled payments, including the BPCI program, are also inadequate uh, to cover the kind of care that's necessary from a transitions perspective. Uh, and the last that we didn't talk about too much, um, uh, but Mary Naylor mentioned this, and I think it's worth uh, stating that uh, strengthening the uh, transitions of care uh, incentive in the star rating program for MAs uh, is worth a look. There's some, it sounds like that could be potentially just do it. Thank you. Right. Thank you for that, uh, Jim. Yeah, I'm going to comment. My comments are going to try to kind of expand on a couple of points uh, that Jim made, uh, specifically around my perspective of physicians and and how they um, may be thinking about some of these things, um, particularly with starting with the primary care doctors um, who have been making investments of time and money, their own time and their own money to build out um, networks that can compete in value-based agreements. Um, so when they're receiving these attributions, we heard and we understand that they're often blinded to the acute episode that's occurring for, with their patients. Um, they're unaware and unable to respond to social determinants of health uh, variables uh, that clearly are dry, major drivers for subpopulations leading to uh, persisting health inequities. They're unable often to stage the patients in the, that it require transitions, to, sca to stage those patients at, a, at levels one through five, like you would CKD, in order to bring the appropriate amount of services to each stage so that you're not over, you know, not over delivering on one and under delivering on another. Um, the, there is technology that's available, it seems, to be able to help stage patients. We, we think that there is, in big data sets now, the ability to use AI and machine learning to predict in populations death in the next 12 months, um, where that would maybe lead to palliative care referral much more reflexively as if, if the score, the AI score, was um, at a certain level. Um, rather than doing 100% palliative care referrals for, for all transitions. Um, readmissions in 90 days, you could identify those with data, better data. Same thing for potential for ED visits or prescription rec uh, compliance and adherence conflicts with the patient and the patient's family. That information, those analyses are available in order to help uh, create a higher level of efficiency in the care of um, patients that are in transitions from acute episodes. The physicians that I'm aware of don't have the time, and we've coined the word in, in the work that I was doing, headroom. The, the physicians don't have the headroom, the space in their heads to consider what we've done over the last two days. And so it's up to us to, to interpret that, to somehow to, to, to distill it down to, and, and then to come with uh, recommendations or service, yeah, recommendations of services that would provide for them some relief in order to address some of our workforce challenges with physicians in their burnout. Let's we use um, the term burnout, principally because they have other pressing concerns based on their history of work. Right? They, it's just there's lots of things on their mind that that says this is much more important than than stopping or slowing down this to do something that really is evidence-based, like what Mary um, or Signify or Sound were able to offer. And so their inability to take the time to critically assess these really brilliant ideas that we heard 
is really a, a liability for a primary care doctors. And then, and then, and, and certainly not the least, uh, um, we were talking about it a little bit ago, um, physicians are increasingly sh starting to shun complexity, the primary care doctors. That is, I, I, you know, I need relief, I need headroom, I need time to, so I don't burn out so I can continue to work. And, but I need to stay out of that comorbid complexity problem as much as possible. So that's not leaning in. <laughs> Just so you, it's not a lean in. It's, a, it's kind of a, a neutral position of not leaning out. And so we've got some real challenges and opportunities. But one of the things that I thought about was that the physician's intrinsic motivation, and one of the, one of the doctors that spoke to us, I think this was uh, John Berkmeyer said this, that, that they would do it for almost break even if they could, because it's the right thing to do. So we don't necessarily need to have this massive ROI per se uh, for physicians to lean into this. Now the corporations that they belong to need the ROI. The doctors themselves may not need the ROI. So I think that this would apply to both employed and independent physicians. And this is, I think, what John was, the point was, I just can't lose money on it. I thought that was a powerful statement. So when you think about it, framing, I thought of the, the doctor as a voter, the doctor as a consumer, the doctor as a parent, as a son or daughter. And I thought about what a doctor would sit, think in those other roles, the other hats that they wear. And I think that the policy thought that we would have, to, we could offer would be like, you know, what we would all agree with is that we ought to reduce waste and we ought to prevent waste. And it gets to Larry's point, which is um, post-acute and pre-acute. The idea that we could actually work on both ends simultaneously or recommend uh, working on both ends simultaneously might make some sense and appeal to physicians to begin to lean toward this issue, even though their headroom hasn't been addressed, with the hope that the headroom that they need would get addressed by the design. Okay. So... I think the physicians would welcome help, right, um, for their attributed patients in a in a value based arrangement in a in a um, probably what we have thought about is the nested model, right, which is you have an ACO that principally is PCP based but not exclusively, that can be flexible to have multiple specialty parts in that, uh, and I think both those doctors in those ACOs would accept some help. Um, but they would have some caveats on accepting that help. And I think if those caveats are not, are not addressed, the doctors will slow it down, if not stop it. And it will be passive aggressive as doctors are ultimately can do that really well, be, be, be passive aggressive. So one of the things that we heard is that the work being, I love the comment of the last thing, work being done around us. I thought the perspective that PCPs and doctors are having work done around them all the time on their patients. That's such a wonderful image. And oftentimes that's, we see that as a universal good, someone working around my patient, working around me to help my patients. As long as I get a visibility into it. In fact, the biggest critique we get around this is I didn't get the note back about what they did, right? I, did, I don't know what they did to my patient when I sent someone out for a consult. So when we extend that, we when we think about um, adding new actors into this into this play, we we have a tendency to describe that those actions, those decisions, as becoming more disintegrated. But so that brings the point of the need to connect in order so it doesn't feel disintegrated. Where then you would get the slowing down um, of the um, positions from participating. And the second thing they need, so they need line of sight, you know, synchronously or asynchronously, so that they just know that it's there, that someone's gonna tell them what they're doing. And the second thing is they need signs of, of, of success, of satisfaction. The patients are actually satisfied, which then makes the doctor satisfied. And then of course the objective performance of lower ED cost and, and uh, readmits and admits. Um, so, I think physicians will lean into this. I think there's a, a way for that to happen. Um, we've talked about it being nested in the ACO, um, would be an effective mechanism for doctors to, to buy in. 
But at the end of the day, we're in a transition. We're not going to all be. And so we have a fee-for-service world that's trying to get doctors to move to value by 2030. All patients are, you know, Medicare patients are going to be in something like that. So we have this kind of window of time. And I thought the concept of pay for the right thing and the accountability, and I think this is what Walter would have been saying, is that, like, look, in the fee-for-service world we're in today, we need some accountability um, for uh, getting, doing TCM, building the code, and, and, we, and we think that we could probably frame that. And it occurred to me that the same points of accountability for the current fee-for-service would also be true for the future uh, um, PMPM or total cost of care. It's the same one, which is lower ER visits, lower readmissions, and you know, lower acute episode um, uh, complications. The patients would like that too, right? They, they would like the fact that they're not having to come home. We heard that too. People want to be at home. And the fact the best thing is to have a zero event uh, with uh, acute episodes. And of course, we know that's not possible. And finally, and, last, and I'll, I'll shut up, is that the, there was really, it's really clear to me that when we heard from some of our, our presenters is that the margins on this business are there today because we're not communicating in an integrated way across the system. It's disparate and it's poor communication, and it exists today. And I think we, we ignore that at our own peril because trying to connect all that needs to be connected to do this good, well, do it better, uh, is going to be really expensive and maintaining it is going to be expensive. And I found out when running a company a of a large physician organization, I could capitalize um, the um, the startup cost oftentimes, but it was that operating cost and the upgrades that would just eat my lunch. And then and then you're kind of um, you're married to it a little bit, and you kind of have to get through that. And of course, at the rate of technology change, that becomes uh, cost prohibitive for a lot of organizations. So I think we really um, I've hit on all those themes, and I'll leave it there for my colleagues to. Uh, round this out. Thank you, Jim. Uh, Lee? Sure, appreciate all those great points and agree with with everything that's been said. A few more that come to my mind, I'm gonna pile on the, the consistent refrain going on now about the third or fourth PTAC model in a row, which is we've got to trend towards fewer voluntary and more mandatory models. I think two meetings ago the refrain was we must make it increasingly uncomfortable in the fee-for-service space. And I'm not sure I'm seeing much in that, in the, in the Medicare fee-for-service space, making it increasingly untenable. Um, so that's an opportunity. I was again struck by the consistent refrain just that must, um, must do for the post-acute space and the community CBO space and data what we did for physician practices and hospitals in the last decade realizing it was a decade and $40 billion, and it's, but it's that important. Um, I was really struck by the, the model that one of our speakers had just, just dividing up, um, I think it was John Berkmeyer, dividing up all the cost in the, in the from admission to, to stable outpatient space and only a third of the cost is in the hospital. It seems like much of the focus is on the hospital-centric side, and it's DRG paid, it's already prospective. I mean, there's just not much scratch there left. There's always waste, you can always do better, but but uh, they're from discharge to stable outpatient care space is essentially untapped and untouched, and that, that needs data to be effective at that. So that, that was pretty compelling to me. Um, I was struck by, you know, I, that was the theme, and I understand that, but speaker after speaker just spoke to the incredible complexity of the transition activity. And um, most of them spoke about having and demonstrating success, uh, but with a dedicated single focus organization. And that's not to say it can't be done. Many of us have done this in just a part of our practice. We knew our patients, knew our families, did our transitions of care for our practices, but that's a model that increasingly doesn't exist in, in modern healthcare. And so I think we have to respect that and think about how we can have uh, many different styles, and I think um, we heard more that the the exact composition of who takes care of it is not as important as, as what gets done, and that just speaks to the, 
the team composition. Everybody spoke to the centrality of a team doing this. And we saw, heard several different models. It doesn't seem to matter much who the, the lead or quarterback position of the team is, much more than it does what, what are the functions that take place in this transition activity. Um, so to a degree, and I, anybody that's done lots of quality improvement work, with all due respect to each of us, sometimes getting the physician out of it is how you do highly reliable scripted work repetitively and raise, raise quality. And so to a degree, this is about health equity and social determinants and connecting to communities and really digging deep in the, in the patient's living environment. Frankly, the, the clinician is less important than the team you, you wrap around this, and that actually matches up with our workforce demands, which is important to think about how we do this. That means there's really not a good linkage to a fee-for-service system then, because of course fee-for-service CPT codes are all dropped by a billing professional, and there's only three Medicare billing professionals by and large, right? So that was all pretty compelling and convicting to me. Um, and then lastly, I was again struck by people who comment on just that the, the downside, upside incentives and downside risks, especially in MIPS, are just not sufficient to drive behavior. And we're uh, certainly have experienced that as well. I think most of us would say something instinctual. It's going to take 30 to 40 percent upside minimum to really change behavior and pursue it. I know in the total cost of care capitated model that I help operate every day for 150,000 beneficiaries. Our model has basically 100% upside and 100% downside, risk adjusted based on utilization and quality. And, and even that changes behavior only slowly. So, thank you. Thank you, Lee. Uh, I want to check with Audrey and see if she has any questions for us or clarifications. Nope. Okay. All right. Um, well, great. This was a great day, um, great two days. And uh, somebody else have a question? Yeah, actually, I had just a couple comments oh, yeah, so yeah, if we have time. Yep, okay. Um, I'll just supplement very briefly because I agree with many of the things that were said. Um, I think one of the things that really struck me was the diversity of different ways people are managing care transitions. You know, it, we're gathering here under the heading of improving the management of care transitions in these population-based models. And I agree with what Lee said. There's just so many different ways in that period. I was also struck with what Grace mentioned about the linkage between the payment model, the operation model, and the, and the kind of um, – patient care model. We're obviously thinking about it from a patient a payment perspective, but I think realizing those interactions, how payment models either support or don't support what we want operationally or a patient care, I think is very important. And the reason I say that is um, I was just struck by also by all the other organizations. They're all doing things a little bit differently. Uh, some are very hammered out very specifically. They even very constructively and pleasantly disagreed with each other on certain things and the way they did it, um, but they've all been driving outcomes that they're proud of. And, and so, you know, I, I'm left with kind of those two things that I heard around um, paying for the right things and paying, you know, clinicians right. And in the diversity of all the different ways that we can manage care transitions, I guess I am left with this sense of in that diversity, some are using TCM CPT codes, maybe not 100%, but I guess if you're an APM, you're using it more. Some don't think that's right. They're doing all the activities, but they're not billing them. Some operationalize it through bundle payments for 90 days. Some drop those bundles into ACOs. Some are suggesting a 60-day case rate. Yes, you know, and I think we just need to recognize that if we are okay with the diversity of patient care models and operational models, maybe we ought to be okay with some variation in the payment approaches as well. Uh, and the moment we move to something that's clean, that's refined, that's simple, we are necessarily saying we are narrowing what we think the patient care and operational model should be. I don't know that we're there today. Maybe that's something that's aspirational, uh, but I think we should grapple with as we think about payment incentives. Right. Thank you, Josh. Uh, Lindsay? I'll be brief because a lot of great points have been made. I think just a couple that I heard that I wanted to make sure we captured is I think the suggestion that the idea of, you know, as we think about testing which payment model is right or which care model is right, when we think about testing implementation, if we take the investment, the upfront investment off the table and pay up front um, and then track results as opposed to expecting to see results and then give payment back, that could be a way to accelerate movement to where we need to be. Um, I think especially uh, that was shared in the context of if you're within an ACO or a system 
where there's already accountability, either through full risk or where there are incentives to reduce utilization, it could reduce the barriers to getting some things tested. And I think the second point that maybe hasn't been raised as much, but you know, as we think about measuring success um, of care transitions, in addition to the measurements of reducing cost and increasing quality, thinking about adding the patient experience as a part of our measurement of success would be something to keep in mind. Um, and then similarly, from the patient perspective, in terms of reducing barriers to utilizing and accessing these services, um, ensuring um, there can be decreased patient responsibility for high value activities. So if we, I think we've, the preponderance of evidence is that transitional care activities are high value things. We should decrease the barriers for patients to want to access these services um, and think about ways we could reduce barriers there. Um, I think the other piece around one of the barriers to effectiveness in this is the attribution. So from a patient perspective, how could we incentivize a patient's choice of attribution into one of these entities that's providing these services could simplify that as well. Thank you. Thank you, Lindsay. It's great. Walter. Thank you. You know, um, one of my old mentors used to say a good way to structure comments is first, point with pride, second, view with alarm, and third, end with hope. So in that vein, I'm gonna to try to uh, make my closing remarks around, uh, around that structure. So first, point with pride. You know, I am super pleased with how the last uh, two days I've went in this public meeting, and I just wanna acknowledge uh, all the really hard work that ASPE and NORC staff have put into this. You know, I think it's been just um, a tremendous day of hearing from experts and also the uh, presentation they put together that I had the fortune uh, to, to present at the very beginning previewed a lot of the themes that we heard over the, the ensuing two days. So just want to thank you, uh, extend the, the uh, sincere round of thanks to both ASPE and um, NORC staff. Now, in terms of viewing with alarm, um, there were a few things today that uh, made me pause. Um, you know, I, I agree with a lot of the comments that have been already been made, and I, I won't rehash them, but just a, a couple points in addition that I would make. Um, one, you know, the, the whole um, idea that we have highly successful participants of value-based programs like Sound and like Signify, those that have scaled a model, passed the market litmus test, uh, we're doing uh, well both clinically and financially, everything that we would want from a model that they had to withdraw from a model program, it was a bit disconcerting to me, right? I mean, I, I think um, you think about all the investments that John Brookmeyer talked about Sound making uh, to make that program work. I'm not sure if they're continuing it or not, but uh, from the sounds of it, um, they couldn't make it work under the new rules, right? And so I think um, as we think about this, uh, PTAC has been so focused on kind of figuring out payment models to foster good clinical models. But I think the point that I think it was Grace that uh, made, we need to go beyond that. It needs to be a scalable operating model that we need to think about. Uh, and how do how do we encourage um, providers and other players to make the investment to transition to value based care without moving the goalpost or you know, pulling the rug out uh, at a later date uh, when they're succeeding? You know, and and so I think that was a bit concerning to me, and uh, I was uh, kind of pondering about that. And um, I know PTAC uh, will be discussing the transition to value-based care over uh, the, our ensuing meetings, but that is something that we, we want to think about because if we can't, I don't want to use the word guarantee, but if we can't um, ensure somehow that the providers or other organizations who make the investment to transition to value-based care can continue to reap the benefits of that, those investments down the line, I, I think that would make that transition very, very difficult. That's one. Um, the other point I would make in terms of uh, viewing with alarm is uh, some of the comments that Rick and others made about uh, the level playing field with Medicare Advantage. Um, 
specifically, there are a couple examples that have came up during the past two days around that. So uh, one example that was discussed yesterday um, during the acute post-acute session was uh, around the three-day waiver for SNF um, benefits. Right now, Medicare Advantage uh, and um, Medicare beneficiaries and two-sided risk ACOs can enjoy the benefits of that waiver, but not under traditional fee-for-service Medicare, right? So that's just one example of uh, a playing field that's, that's not level. Um, another example is uh, something that Dr. Brookmeyer brought up around the ratchet effect of bundle payments, right? So um, we have these programs where you have a ratchet effect and uh, your um, baseline is reset uh, based on your good performance. And that can only go so far. We've heard other SMEs talk about this at prior sessions as well. Uh, and I don't think that's necessarily something that Medicare Advantage has to uh, deal with, right? And, and so, you know, I, I wonder if we're kind of designing into the system, um, some, uh, into some of these pilots, um, a failure point, if you will. Um, and, and so that, that was also a, a bit concerning. Um, finally, uh, end with hope. You know, I, I think that this, these two days have renewed my enthusiasm for focusing on care transitions. Um, there's ample evidence, as we've heard again and again from our experts, of the efficacy of these programs, uh, and there are many of them out there, um, including the ones that were presented uh, to us. Uh, and they've all sh uh, shown really great clinical results. Um, we have payment models uh, that have uh, shown to be success. Uh, and, you know, I think we have a lot of learnings that we can build on. Um, and ultimately, you know, I think where I'm left with, uh, with all this is um, focusing more and more on pain for outcomes uh, rather than paying the providers for services, right? Because, you know, if you're paying uh, for transitional care services, isn't that just another form of paying fee for service? Right? So I, I think ultimately we should be thinking about how we can encourage uh, future models to have a very focused um, lens of pain for outcomes. Thank you, Walter. Those, those are great comments. And I want to uh, reiterate some of the things you said in terms of just thanking everybody today. Uh, appreciate everybody's time, particularly our expert presenters and panelists who donated their time to prepare and to spend time with us today presenting uh, to all my colleagues around the table here uh, who really contributed to making these last few days successful. And I think particularly to uh, Aspie and Nork, who do all the hard work behind the scenes and really make our lives uh, very easy in terms of trying to uh, run, run these meetings and, and move uh, value-based care forward. So just to uh, leave with those appreciations. Uh, we explored many different facets of how population-based models can occur smooth care transitions for patients over the last two days. Um, We'll continue to gather information uh, on our themes through a request for input on our topic. Uh, we're posting it on the ASPE PTAC website and sending it out through the PTAC listserv. Uh, you can offer your input on our questions by July the 14th. The committee will work to issue a report to the secretary with our recommendations from this public meeting. And with that, uh, the meeting is adjourned. So thanks to everybody. Produced by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services.